Good day. Thanks for the opportunity to present at the GA4JH conference. And I'm going to be sharing a bit about what we do within the Public Health Alliance for Genomic Epidemiology Consortium in response to some of the data sharing challenges. Um, back in March 2019, and if you can imagine an era pre-COVID-19, a meeting was convened of both bioinformatics stakeholders as well as public health officials. And really this event was aimed at trying to understand how do we bring bioinformatics closer to the public health space and acknowledging that within public health, the need for implementation beyond the academic development of software. And so through this event, um, what was really clear was that one was looking for a community-driven um, model where we could promote public health bioinformatics and target specific development of tools that would facilitate the uptake within the public health space. And during that event, um, the GA4GH model was repeatedly visited so that we could try and understand just how GA4GH has successfully um, set themselves up in order to respond to a community need. And keeping in mind that around about this time, a number of other events had taken place. Um, one in particular would be the work done through the Africa Center for Disease Control and Prevention, where back in 2018, um, if people on the African continent were trying to look at how do we facilitate more rapid uptake of next generation sequencing in the response to disease outbreaks. And so it was quite timely that this event occurred in 2019 for us to try and collectively think through how do we build the processes that could best accelerate the uptake of bioinformatics within the public health space. And really, I think what I want to point out here is that the gap really in this discussion was around what is being developed in the academic space in terms of bioinformatics tools and the public health applications which are critically needed. Um, two years later, what we have is PHAGE, which is the acronym for the Public Health Alliance for Genomic Epidemiology. And really, we are a collection of international researchers and public health implementation experts we, we essentially share a common vision, and that is wanting to promote standards, ensuring they are reproducible assays, as well as bioinformatic workflows. And with all of this, wanting to ensure that we can reduce the barrier to entry for routine sequencing. Um, and all of this work is carried out by a range of technical working groups. I've listed them on this slide. Some of them have been much more active than others and many of the activities initially envisaged for these working groups were realigned with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so when we really look at this, we have, we have about 110 members at the moment scattered across 68 countries. And the challenge with showing a slide like this, inevitably, the slide is all, already out of date. And let me just, don't be too alarmed And you're seeing one representation of a group in the US and one in Canada. That is not the case. In terms of the cluttering of the slide, I've just indicated one position here, which actually represents more than 15 institutions. But as we start to think about barriers to data sharing in public health, it's actually interesting to revisit a paper that came out in 2014 where researchers did a systematic review and essentially looked at what were the barriers that were reported um, over a number of years. And six years later, seven years later, it is actually interesting to see that many of these barriers still remain valid. Um, I have just listed them here, but also added a few more just based on some of the work that we've been doing in engaging with public health 
practitioners in trying to understand how people respond to disease outbreaks or how people respond in times of an emergency. But you know, as one talk about barriers to public health, I think often one the conversation doesn't extend to the point that data sharing is very much part and parcel of data governance. And so I've just put this slide up here, which was really taken from a report put out by the Pan-American Health Organization. And really what it clearly shows is the underlying data, which is critical to this life cycle, which is depicted here. But I think we need to keep in mind that as we speak of data sharing, it is really underpinning good data governance. And when one speaks about an organization's data governance processes, it's a combination of people, processes, as well as technology. And I think this is probably where it is very key that there is a much more complex ecosystem at play when we are trying to address or trying to respond to issues around data sharing. And so what does that really mean for Phage? And so what I would like to do in the next few minutes is really share with you three examples of what the working groups are busy working on and maybe share with you some idea as to how we are looking at implementation strategies um, in response to some of the standards that we are building. And so let me start with the Data Structures Working Group, and this group is led by Emma Griffiths at the Simon Fraser University in Canada. And this working group is really looking at interoperability and also reprodu reproducibility of workflows. Um, there is a lot of cross-talk between a range of technical working groups, but I wish to just highlight two standards that have been worked on within the Data Structures Working Group in collaboration with your Pipelines Working Group as well as the Infrastructure working group. And the first one is really producing a metadata standard for collecting SARS-CoV-2 biospecimens and data in the field. And so you can appreciate that there is an, there's quite a bit of contextual information that accompanies the collection of a biospecimen. And so what this work has really been looking at is how do we define certain parameters, certain features that are critical at the point of collection so that we can enrich the data for subsequent usage and also for integration. Um, and as you can imagine, in a health emergency, what you really need is to be able to share data timelessly with organizations, trusted partners, international agencies and also public repositories. And what the slide is really pointing out is the disparity or the variability among the different data structures that we have. And this is an example of forms utilized within a private database or also these reference laboratories that gets recruited and also what we have within the public databases. And so how do we put to the user a set of metrics that should be considered when collecting biospecimens, particularly during a health emergency. And I think this becomes one thing we are seeing in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. In the rush to do testing, um, there is an opportunity that is missed during the collection of, bi of biospecimens. And very often we see publications where people repeatedly speak to data collection that has only been collected for purposes of a disease outbreak. And what you do not have is the wherewithal or the capability built into the system to be able to revisit this information. And so this contextual data standard that has been, has been developed includes a range of components. We're talking about information about about the virus itself, about exposure, um, there's information about the sources of information, and being cognizant of the fact that there are a number of international standards out there. And so when one is building a particular metadata standard, I think 
to ensure interoperability, it is key that we consider how our standard maps to existing standards. Um, what I'm just pointing out here is just a simple spreadsheet and this is really allowing the user to understand what we've defined as a required field and that is highlighted for you in yellow although the sheet is much longer um, there are certain recommended fields in purple and then there are optional fields in white and so what you would see is that as we share this with users um, people might decide that there are certain fields which we have regarded as optional which they feel is actually critically important and I think it is that iterative process of refining these standards which I think becomes a useful component to the work that we do alongside public health officials uh, and you can imagine that what is very important in terms of encouraging the uptake of a metadata standard is the provision of material that will allow users to better understand what is required and also to help them with the transition of adopting a operation operating procedure within their labs and so we've made available reference guides um, at the moment there is work being done on providing a video tutorial and these are mechanisms by which one is wanting to build capacity within laboratories for people to better utilize this particular standard. <clears throat> As I've mentioned before, we are really looking at how do we provide an enabling environment whereby users are, are able to better leverage the standards that we are developing. And this is just an example of some of the protocols that we have available that will allow you to submit data to a range of international repositories. A second project within the Data Structures Working Group is really looking at standardizing antimicrobial resistance gene detection um, output. And this work is driven by Finlay, Innes, and Emma. Um, and they have really been the drivers behind this particular standard. Um, and essentially what you have is currently there are a range of AMR prediction tools and each of them will have a particular outputs and what the phage harmonization pipeline is intended to do is really to standardize the outputs of each of these tools so that one could have a specification at the end which one could then more easily relate one output to another and this then becomes part of the toolkit that we are making available to researchers as well as implementation scientists. So what, is, what does these two examples mean for phage? Well, we have embarked on a program where we are wanting to partner with public health laboratories. And by doing this, we have made available sub-awards, um, a small amount of funding that will allow public health laboratories to test, to implement, to reflect, and really to look at how well do the standards that we've been developing apply to the field. And so what we have done is we have created a sub-award for approximately 10 laboratories to interrogate and apply the SARS-CoV-2 metadata standard as well as the AMR harmonization tool to the laboratories. And what we've really been doing is, and this is just a summary of what we've been working on, we have these two sub-awards and we have put out a call for applications, reviewed these and awarded 10 groups these sub-grants to the value of about 20 to 30,000 US dollars and really it is wanting to understand in practice how these data standards are being applied and if needs be how should they be refined and to this effect we have identified 10 groups 
and this particular award has been earmarked for both Africa and Southeast Asia. And what you're just seeing here is the list of institutions that we have identified. And what the one thing that you do realize is that through this process, one becomes more and more aware of the skill set which resides within academic institutions um, and some of that not necessarily in national public health laboratories who have a public health mandate in order to carry out a public health response. And so what we are very keen on doing with these awards is to ensure that we have a transfer and exchange of skills and knowledge from national academic institutions to national public health facilities. Um, we have a second round of awards which we will be um, executing in our next round of funding where we, where we really wanting to come alongside public health laboratories and find ways in which one could strengthen them in order to ensure the uptake of our phage stands. So while I've spoken about the the data structures working group, I'd like to now at this point just shift gears a bit and maybe just highlight some of the work that we are doing in the ethics data sharing working group. And this group is led by Nikki Tiffin and they have a vibrant team within this working group that has really been using an online forum, which you have to register for, in order to engage on various topics around sharing information and in the context of pandemics is how do you share data um, du during an outbreak. Um, and some of these discussions that have been underway is really starting to form the beginning or the starting point of some um, conceptual um, papers that they are wanting to release into the public space for comment. And so what we have done is in trying to harness some of the work within the ethics and data sharing working group, we have looked at a few sub awards to individuals, to organizations that are really interrogating how best to engage a range of stakeholders when we start to speak about what constitutes ethical data sharing. And so we have identified four groups um, and these groups um, are scattered on the African continent um, with very specific niche um, areas. One of them in the DRC and Gabon is really looking at how does one set up, con continue to provide online ethics training resources um, to a range of public health implementation scientists as well as research centers. We have a group that's really looking at trying to understand ethics review boards within country in order to understand what processes are being implemented and if necessary, what needs to be revised. We have a project around scientific citizenship um, and it is mechanisms by which one could engage a particular stakeholder and that is school learners and using mother tongue instruction in order to do so. Something that is very prevalent um, currently is vaccine hesitancy. And we've had an application from a group in Nigeria that is wanting to really engage the community around factors that contribute to vaccine hesitancy. And these are the initial projects that is forming part and parcel of the roadmap for the ethics and data sharing working group. Um, recognizing that the one, the one aspect that we've noticed during this period is the need to provide added support to researchers who are wanting to engage on topics of ethics and data sharing. So as our new funding stream comes on board, we are wanting to explore how we could come alongside national public health laboratories in particular in order to build up the capacity in order to um, action some of the ethics projects that um, people are wanting to do within the public health space. And probably the third example really is looking at the infrastructure working group. And this is led by two co-chairs, 
um, Peter van Eusen at the University of Western Cape and Danny Parks at the Broad Institute. Um, and so it's quite great to have a link directly with GA4GH um, through Danny Parks' involvement. And this working group has really been busy during these two years in really trying to firstly map out landscapes in how best do we share both tools and workflows across a range of environments, um, be that resource limited settings or really finding ways um, in which one could best provision for a range of different public health laboratories. And one, and one partnership which we've embarked on is a strategic partnership with one of the founding members of FAGE, and that is the Africa Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And we've partnered with the Africa CDC in trying to assist them in developing a conceptual framework around a data platform. Um, and so if one looks at the Africa CDC's approach for building capacity in national public health institutes, what you see is um, we have a mechanism whereby which you have member states who essentially would rely on a regional sequencing hubs in order to carry out some of the sequencing requirements. Um, so the way that the the rollout of a response to COVID-19 has happened is the establishment of regional hubs, which would be sequencing facilities that could provide sequencing in a geographic region. And that would help to support some countries where there are not sufficient capacity. Um, the, the Africa CDC is also busy engaging with its member states in looking at material transfer agreements. And so what you see within this slide is a technical support provided through expertise regionally together with more of a policy driven support that is happening between um, member states. Uh, and I think the critical thing here is understanding um, the data transfer. And this is something that I think is something that is pertinent to both GA4GH as well as phage. And really, as phage, we see this as one component where there is probably opportunity to align some of the work that we are doing within phage as well as what is happening within GA4GH. And one such example is the data use ontologies and initial discussions um, with GA4GH has certainly been encouraging in us recognizing the utility of some of the standards that GA4GH has developed and how we could potentially refine these as part of um, encouraging and accelerating the utility of data sets um, related to pathogens. And I think as we start to engage on this, I think what is very important that there needs to be partners that are involved in just trying to understand the landscape within countries. And while the slide is um, specific to Africa, this is by no means a topic that is restricted to the African continent, but the development and the evolution of technical innovation, such as what is being proposed with these ontologies as a way for sharing data sets, has to happen alongside an, an understanding of the policies and the frameworks that would be needed in order to facilitate cross-border sharing. And so this is, we are, we are quite excited about the opportunity to explore this mechanism of working alongside GA4GH. And I think these will be really, there'll be an opportunity for us to um, move forward on this as we go into 2022. And so I'd like to then maybe conclude, um, and even though I've shared with you examples of the data sharing working group, I've spoken briefly about some of the projects that have started in the ethics um, working group. Um, we've, uh, in fact, I've initially started talking to you about the data standards working group and also work that's been done within the infrastructure working group. I haven't really spoken about our bioinformatics pipelines, 
group and really that working group is really integral to lots of the discussion and lots of the work that's being done within phage and so i've just put in here a really a basic workflow that is critical to a public health setting and so each of the public health laboratories that we engage with um, are certainly busy trying to understand and improve on biospecimen collection preparing these specimens and really at the point in which data is being generated and then how one best analyze that data in order to have information that can inform a timely public health response. And with this entire framework, we have embedded phage working groups within each of these steps. And so as we reflect on the last two years of phage and looking forward to the next phase of phage's growth, it's really wanting to ensure that within our working groups that we are able to develop the toolkits, um, improve on the protocols that is needed to capacitate your public health laboratories so that they could start to probably encouraging them to ensure that we can start to get to a point of real-time responses to it to a disease outbreak and so very often one is having conversations around how do we respond to COVID-19 but really in our bioinformatics space um, one needs to also step back and start to ask how do we abstract these learnings in order to look at more generally responding to disease outbreaks and I am reminded in my discussions with the Africa CDC that the African continent is monitoring in excess of 100 disease outbreaks each year. And so as we develop um, potential solutions to COVID-19, one has to constantly think about the sustainability of those in order to strengthen public health laboratories in responding to many other disease outbreaks that would plague the globe. And so with that, I wish to just say thank you very much to um, our partners. We have a number of groups that are actively involved in the activities of age. Um, and I think we're really looking forward to an exciting time um, moving forward and also in um, new partnerships that we can build and grow with GA4GH as well. Thanks so much for this opportunity to present some of the work that we are doing within Phage.